Or so thank you for for inviting me and I look forward to our, our conversation that we're hopefully we'll have um, at the end of the day, which is excellent. Um, so I'm, as, as you mentioned, Torsten, I'm the lead for the uh, Critical Digital Humanities Initiative at the University of Toronto, which is a three year, two and a half million dollar project designed to support digital humanities projects at the University of Toronto. Uh, including history. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that as well in the Q&A. So my, my work in this area has led me to kind of reflect upon the relationship between publicly engaged oral history work, which I do, and the field of digital history. So I'm just going to start out with a few reflections around that, because uh, as you'll see with my presentation, my work isn't really especially engaged with the kind of back-end computational methods approach uh, I do deal with large data sets, uh, but my focus has been, for the most part, on the on the front end, if you will, uh, thinking about the relationship between uh, the digital project and the audience uh, and through the lens of public history uh, as my approach to digital history. So we have a tendency to think of digital history as a synonym for computational methods, um, an approach that finds its roots in the Clio metrics of the 1970s. And here I'm gonna be citing some of the US and Canadian historiography. I apologize in advance for not being so familiar with the German, but it's probably similar in some ways. So Chad Galfield here in Canada has recently argued in an article in the Canadian Historical Review, charting the history of digital history as a field in the US and Canada during the era of the mainframe computer. And he describes a history by numbers approach uh, in which encountered critiques in the 1980s with a call for a return to narrative. And this kind of history is also within literary studies as well. If you think about the uh, origins of DH, uh, the, the flourishing of DH in the 70s, and then the kind of critique of uh, DH by postmodernists in particular in the 80s and 90s. Then in the rise of web, with the rise of web technologies in the 1990s, digital history shifted once more away from strictly computational methods and towards public history and knowledge mobilization. And I'll point to 1993 in particular as a type of watershed year in the United States, because that was the year in which the US historian Roy Rosenzweig, who was the founder, one of the founders of the Radical History Review, he had published a series of field defining works in labor history, public history, and digital history. And then he went on to found George Mason University's Center for History and New Media in 1993. And the George Mason Center has gone on to create tools such as Zotero and Omeka as well as that camp and other kinds of initiatives in digital history. Um, and 1993 also saw the publication of William G. Thomas's and Edward Ayer's CD-ROM and website project on the US Civil War, which was called the Valley of the Shadow. So this is a version of digital history, in other words, that is my work is more directly indebted to because it involves basically kind of public history. Um, Roy Reisenzweig was really key in the area of public history and thinking about engagements uh, with the public as really central to digital history. So the varying threads of digital history as a field find their parallel in digital humanities origin stories. So as Tara McPherson has argued in her recent book, Feminist in a Software Lab, most definitions of DH define the field as descending from humanities computing in the 1940s, especially the work of Jesuit scholar Roberto Busa and his text encoding work on Thomas Aquinas. As McPherson notes, the 2004 influential Companions of Digital Humanities, which popularized the term DH, emphasizes the importance of text markup to the field of DH a methodology that is central to many uh, DH projects in literary studies. And that's particularly strong in Canada because some of these folks are in Canada, like Ray Siemens and Lynn Siemens, and people are working out of the Electronic Cultures Lab, and they're the ones behind that companion to digital humanities volume that I just mentioned. So as an alternative genealogy for digital humanities as a field, um, oops, sorry. Um, 
McPherson turns not to the history of literature, but to the history of design and to user experience. In fact, the Valley of the Shadow Project, which you know, we can see here as, as a figure, is the very first figure actually in her book. And she points out that at the same time that Father Busa was working with IBM to create the index Damasticus, the designers Ray and Charles Eames were creating museum displays also for corporate clients, including IBM, which visualized data for broad audiences. And use, she uses as an example their film, The Powers of Ten. So her, her larger point here is not to debate Father Busa's importance to the history of dig, digital humanities or to disparage computational methods in terms of its relationship to the field, but simply to kind of foreground or surface an alternative genealogy that brings aesthetics and visuality and design into the history of digital humanities. And, and she, of course, does that with her own research uh, on Scalar and other projects. As she argues, the origin stories for digital humanities have often privileged text and processing, but these stories don't tell the full tale of computation's intersections with the humanities and with the human. So basically, I'm trying to map out a kind of twin uh, genealogy for digital history, one that is indebted to, say, Cleometrics and the other user-centered design. So the project I'm going to be presenting on today descends from this alternate uh, origin point for digital history, one that emphasizes knowledge mobilization and public engagement. And then to add to the mix, I'm going to throw in um, basically oral history, uh, my the impact of social media on digital history and queer and trans studies. Um, oral history has its own rich contributions to digital humanities and digital history, which I'd be happy to talk more about. And there's some really interesting work happening with working with the ri very rich and massive data sets in oral history um, in terms of digital history and digital humanities. But um, there's not a lot, it's not as much happening there as one would think. Um, so if people have projects to recommend, I'm happy to hear them. So the project I'm going to be talking about today is the current focus of the research group that I direct, the collaboratory that Torsten mentioned. And basically, uh, this was founded in 2014, and it's a Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada funded public and digital humanities research initiative, which is focusing on queer, trans, and gay life stories using new methodologies in digital history, collaborative research, and archival practice. Our research uh, co-creates anti-racist, queer, and trans documentary heritage for future scholars, community members, while creating a usable past for LGBTQ2 plus people in the present. We have been working collaboratively with a variety of archival partners, including the Archives here in Canada, which is the largest community-based queer and trans archive in the world, uh, the University of Victoria's Transgender Archives, the Archives of Lesbian Oral Testimony, the Digital Transgender Archive. And we have uh, been doing some of the work that we have done is uh, digitize and make accessible uh, sort of uh, older projects, community-based projects like Lesbians Making History and Fool's Cap. We've also uh, created our own projects like the Trans Healthcare Activism in Ontario Project and a recent one on trans activism. Um, and we've also done some kind of archival activism projects like building, creating a trans collections guide, which is the first collections guide for the archives creating digital exhibitions, doing public programs, uh, usually in collaboration with uh, the archives. So our current oral history project that we've been focusing on is the Pussy Palace Oral History Project. Um, and it's a collaboration with uh, the archives and with 36 narrators to document the last major police raid of a queer bathhouse in Canadian history. And we have um, a team of folks who've been working on it, which I'll introduce in the end via a slide, including uh, Alicia Stranges, who's our project manager and was also the lead oral historian for this project. Um, and a bunch of students fundamentally who have done some really fabulous uh, work. So before I discuss the project, uh, what we've been doing, I just wanna give you a quick, quick overview of what 
the project um, actually what the what the project documents and uh, since I'm not going to assume that you know anything about this so basically the Pussy Palace was a series of queer and women queer women and trans bathhouse events organized by a group of sex radicals in Toronto between the late 1990s and about 2014. The organizing committee was a group of queer friends and sex educators who really wanted to address the invisibility of queer women's sexuality. And so it was actually started out, oddly enough, as a kind of HIV prevention uh, campaign. And because um, a lot of HIV prevention happens in the context of men's bathhouses, they wanted a place to launch a campaign directed at women, but there are no women's bathhouses. So they decided to create one in order to have this HIV prevention uh, campaign be launched, but then it ended up uh, being a bit uh, more ambitious uh, than that. So um, they rented a, a basically a men's bathhouse, uh, Club Toronto, for their first event in fall of 1998. Um, and at this first event, over 400 women stood in line in the rain to get in. And inside it was a bit bacchanalian as one organizer described it. For one night only, women and trans folk ran riot in a men's bathhouse. Uh, and basically just to be clear, people are having public sex. This is the point of a bathhouse, um, not to have any euph euphemisms here. So Club Toronto was actually it still exists an old Victorian. You can see it here on the right with four floors, including an outdoor pool, sauna, to hot tub, showers, a small dance floor um, and a, dozens of small rooms with a basic bed and locker. And because this kind of event was very much new to most of the participants, they organized, created a series of activities for patrons, including safe sex pointers, demonstrations, visits with somebody called the temple goddess. There was a photo room, lots of different kinds of activities. Um, and queer women and trans people milled about in various stages of undress, flirting, dancing, drinking, having sex. So the Pussy Palace as an event was queer, not only in relationship to sexuality, but also in terms of the radical meaning of the term queer as it relates to non-normativity. One of the main organizers was the radical activist Chanel Gallant, who was very explicit about the relationship between policing queer sex, for example, and policing the sexuality of, quote, single mothers, sex workers, and anyone else visibly defying the bounds of acceptable sexuality. So the Pussy Palace validated sexualities that fail to conform to middle class norms of heterosexuality and marital privacy. So Toronto has a long history of raiding gay men's bathhouses. And let, let me just say that um, in, in, in the US, as you may know, um, during the AIDS crisis, the bathhouses were shut down. They were simply closed, but that wasn't true in Canada, wasn't true in Toronto. Um, and so the bathhouses were open during the 80s and 90s, um, but there was also a kind of, um, kind of morality squad approached these bathhouses that and they were periodically raided the most uh, most significant series of raids in the case of the men's gay bathhouses took place in 1981 and there's been a lot of literature written about that uh, those bathhouse raids but since that period of the early 80s there had been pretty much a kind of truce if you will between the queer community and the police but for some reason, variety of different reasons, that's that truth started to unravel in the summer of 1999, and the police started to raid some of the gay male bathhouses again. And then in September of 2000, they turned their attention to the Pussy Palace. And incidentally, it was I had just moved to Toronto from the states in 2000. And I, I was like, what is going on here? I just felt like I'd gone back to the 1950s or something. It, it was very, it was very surprising, and it. it basically uh, got a huge amount of press. So on September 14th of the night of two, uh, in 2000, claiming to be investigating a criminal complaint, police sent in two undercover female police officers who stripped down to towels and collected evidence. Then they left and then five male undercover officers arrived at 12.45 a.m. And four of them toured all three four floors, knocking down all four floors, knocking down doors, questioning patrons, basically kind of intimidating people. 
While the lead investigator questioned uh, one of the volunteers, J.P. Hornick, who was at the entrance. And J.P. Hornick was one of the two volunteers who had signed the liquor license and was one of the two people who was eventually arrested. So while the police circulated the club, they confronted the patrons, uh, most of whom, of course, were partially or fully undressed, asking for ID, staring, creating hostile environment. Most people, of course, were very upset, and most of them left. And then police charged two of the organizers, including J.P. Hornick, with six violations each of violating the Liquor Act. Two days after this, uh, organizers met in Chanel's kitchen to plan a response. And in their analysis, the police raid was part of a broader pattern of police harassment against marginalized communities in Toronto, including not only gay men's sexual spaces, such as bars and parks, but also the policing of communities of color. Organizers wrote a press release and they organized an event to the local queer community center called the 519. Hundreds attended. And then very unexpectedly, this turned into a march on the local police station, Division 52, where they resurrected the 1981 bathhouse raid chants with a twist. Fuck you, 52, pussies bite back. F Fuck you, 52 was the chant from 1981, which was um, sort of like, people call it sort of Canada's Stonewall because there were so many thousands of people who were um, out in the streets protesting the police in 1981. They also, uh, the police headquarters, the, or the organizers and activists um, at the Pussy Palace staged a kiss-in and a bit later a panty picket where they arrived with a show of panties and garters and bras and boas and signs that shouted, sluts can't be shamed. So as you can see, uh, their protest style was quite uh, flamboyant, fun, and unrepentantly pro-sex in the words of one of the uh, organizers. They also organized a very intense legal response. Uh, they had, their defense was basically that their right to privacy had been violated by the male police officers and their efforts to collect evidence in the raid. And in 2002, um, they were vindicated. The, the judge dismissed all uh, charges. And the Pussy Palace organizers also brought a class action lawsuit and a human rights complaint against the police alleging that their rights and freedoms of women had been uh, violated under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. They reached a settlement of $350,000, which they put into a fund to support higher education for queer and trans youth, for sex workers community service projects, and also for their remaining legal fees. They also spent some of the money um, conducting a community consultation on how to improve relations with the police, particularly in relationship to uh, trans people. Um, and all of this legal activity and the defense, I mean, it, was, it got a huge amount of uh, media coverage um, in, in nationally in Canada at the time. There's a lot more I could say about it, but I won't because the, ma the main point I wanna get to is, is our, our project. So basically, we're, we've done the interviewing for the project, and we've archived uh, the interviews, and now we're kind of dealing with some of the larger questions of uh, public engagement. I'll talk about the challenges and strategy in a second, but I, before I do that, I just wanted to share this kind of slide that, in my viewpoint, represents the kind of life cycle of an oral history project, with one being... Uh, preparation, devising the research design, building relationships, et cetera, two being collection, um, establishing workflows, dealing with, uh, connecting with narrators, conducting interviews, three, processing, drafting the transcripts, editing, dealing all the metadata, four, archiving, um, which, and we've done all of those, and we've done five, and now we're working on basically uh, six, seven, and eight. So I'll just switch to that, which is a kind of overlapping set of projects that involve public pro events, uh, research creation, which I'm talking about today, and more traditional academic uh, outputs. I don't have a, I don't have a number here for let's call it data creativity, like having fun with data, because I haven't really done that so much with this project, but um, it is something I'd be interested in, in doing. So let me just, uh, 
So um, one of the questions that some of the challenges that we're dealing with is how can these digital oral history projects engage with broader publics in the age of social media? And how can we make our oral histories accessible in meaningful ways? Because we're long past a time where simply putting oral histories online, as we did say 10 years ago, is going to really address accessibility in any meaningful way. So one could argue, and people have argued, that uh, social media has really introduced a new era in digital history. YouTube was founded in 2005, Twitter 2006, Instagram 2010, TikTok in 2016, and social media has really changed how people encounter historical knowledge. Jason Steinhauer describes the rise of what he calls e-history, or discrete media products like YouTube videos circulating on social media and designed to increase visibility. And the goal for many of these, of course, is attention. It's a monetary uh, approach generally. It's not necessarily historical accuracy. A lot of these projects lift from the historical record, condensing complex events and histories into iconic images, or in some cases, nostalgic appeals. And this is frankly how most people encounter history these days, one could argue, is through social media. As Steinhauer observes, quote, the web and social media have birthed new forms of communicating history that over time have made the classroom lecture, the scholarly monograph, and the journal article feel increasingly antiquated and impenetrable. Meanwhile, academic history is a field hasn't really caught up with these developments. So recently I did a search in the Public Historian, which is the journal of record for the field of public history uh, in North America. I, I did a search on the term Instagram, and I got only three articles that engage with social media as a genre or as a public history strategy. In other words, it just happened to mention Instagram. Um, the American Historical Association, excuse me, the Amor American Historical Review launched its digital initiative only in 2020, and there's really no equivalent in Canada. So. It's just basically an observation that probably many would share in this group that as a as a profession, uh, I think the history profession is really hasn't yet come to terms with um, social media and its relationship to historical knowledge. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're trying to figure out how can we engage with broader publics in the age of social media. No one's going to sit down and watch a two-hour oral history interview. I mean, those of us who do the oral history interview to begin with can't even sit down for two hours and watch them afterwards. So how are we going to uh, reach broader publics? Um, and one of, one of the approaches that we're taking is through uh, research creation. And... Research creation is one of these terms that um, I don't know if you have an equivalent in Germany, but in Canada, it's been defined by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada as, quote, an approach to research that combines creative and academic research practices and supports the development of knowledge and innovation through artistic expression, scholarly investigation and experimentation. The creation process is situated within the research activity and produces, produces critically informed work in a variety of media. So the term research creation was originally was started, I think it was coined by artists who are in the academy who are trying to make their creative work legible for more traditional research outcomes and claiming that their painting, if you will, or their performance art were was just as much research as the rest of us who are writing academic articles. But since then, there are a lot of um, our, uh, our academics who are not trained as artists who are reaching out to aesthetic forms to create research products, if you will. So it's being sort of used uh, in both, both by artists and by non-artists. Non so we are really conceptualizing our work as being a type of research creation as a method of reaching broader publics with our public history uh, work. Whether or not we're successful is a whole other question. I could talk about that later. So now I'm gonna just talk about some of what these strategies have been. So our first attempts at digital research creation involved the production of live action shorts working with our uh, Zoom footage. These are three to five minute uh, videos 
excerpted directly from the footage and the highlighting compelling themes that we saw uh, emerging from our research. Um, some of these are very irreverent based upon the team. Um, for example, Nancy's outfit, which describes Naughty Nancy, who is a real character describing what she wore to one of the events. We published these on YouTube and promoted their release across our social media platforms. Um, and, and these, even though these have the lowest productive production values, they've actually been uh, pretty successful in terms of the numbers of people who've been watching them. We've also done a lot of work on, some work on Instagram. Um, we wanted to amplify the stories of people who were not as well known, uh, who were less visible in terms of the events of the Pussy Palace. Um, and so we created a series of these uh, different Instagram stories. Um, for example, over 19 episodes, one series depicts an average night at the, at the palace from start to finish. And the themes were based on commonly held memories that uh, we were shared across the various interviews uh, that we did. Then we also did a series of audiograms. Um, we released 14 of these, which are short resonant sound bites collected from over the 45 hours of interviews that we did. And this for me was inspired by the Archives of American Art, which has a really lovely kind of excerpt series that they do of audiograms uh, based upon the um, oral history interviews that they have of artists in their archives. So essentially each uh, episode featured a very gently edited, edited one to three minute audio clip from our interviews laid over film footage from the exterior of uh, 231 Mutual Street, which is where the uh, events took place. Um, and we published these um, on YouTube, our YouTube channel and social media platforms, but in all honesty, there wasn't a lot of um, uh, take up. And YouTube in general is not um, a really dynamic platform for this kind of work, as we discovered. And I'm part of this, <laughs> group called Oral History Association, Oral History Archivists Special Interest Group. Now that's an archi arcane group, which is basically archivists for oral history projects. And um, so I had a conversation with some folks there and one person recommended that we try TikTok as a place to get more uh, take up for our work. So, um, so we did that and we took the same uh, series from the audiograms and we converted them into uh, TikTok and um, gave it a go. And this was actually much more successful. Uh, we found that for quick comparison, episode one earned a mere 57 views on YouTube in its original form and over 1300 on TikTok in its revised form. So to help uh, contextualize this next form of research creation that I'm gonna share with you, I just wanna very quickly jump back to the design process for the oral history project uh, itself, because I wanna talk about these, um, these sensory portraits that we created. And this, um, in, the, in the earlier stages of our work, we created a series of shorts called sensory portraits. And the shorts drew from our querying of oral history methods and a transformation in aesthetics and design. So in terms of querying the methods, um, when we were developing the interview guide, I was really interested in learning about the narrator's effective engagement with the Pussy Palace events. And methodologically speaking, this raises a really interesting challenge, which is how, how can you actually interview people about their effective and somatic relationship to the past? Because for, in terms of oral history, there's really often not a lot of point in asking narrators basic empirical questions such as what happened because in fact, the police, uh, you know, the, all the events were heavily reported by the police. So if all you're looking for is basic empirical information, probably oral history is not the best methodology, right? Because you can just do traditional archival research to get those um, answers, quest those questions answered. Um, but 
What if you want to ask questions that are really more about the subjective engagement uh, of the narrators in relationship to the events? And this is sort of referencing some of the historiography and literature within oral history as a field to kind of really thinking about oral histories and what they what they can and can't tell us about the past. Um, so one of the things about a lot of uh, interview guides for oral history projects, I would say, or qualitative interviewing in general, is that they don't usually engage with all five senses. They're not usually asking narrators to think about or to reflect upon sight, sound, smell, taste. Do you, see, do you see what I'm saying? And so then what ends up happening is sometimes the oral history um, narr narrators can be, it can be a little bit flat in terms of how they're describing the past. So these are almost like tools of creative nonfiction in a way to kind of try to get narrators to engage with the past through uh, using a, a multi-sensory approach, uh, if you will. Um, so when I was talking with Alicia, who was the lead interviewer for this, I shared with her some literature in oral history and in queer theory, um, like, for example, Paula Hamilton, who's written on sound and oral history and the sonic aspects of oral history, or Anne Spetkovich or Sarah Ahmed on thinking about various theoretical approaches to affect, feeling, and emotion in relationship to uh, the queer record. Um, and then Alicia went away and came up with this really a surprising approach um, to the interview. Um, she has a, a kind of theater background and she inserted a brief guided meditation basically into the interview guide, which is kind of wild <laughs> that she basically led the narrators on this, you know, a little bit of a meditation. She asked them to close their eyes and led through through a set of questions and some of the narrators were like no way i'm not doing this you know whatever and others really went for it uh it was i mean we're not going to show you too much of that but it was really surprising um what she was able to um, elicit with the narrators um and we recently we got a lot of fantastic uh reflections that uh we decided to kind of put into these uh sensory portrait as, as we call them. So you can see here we have a slide of Alicia leading Robin Woodward in this meditation. Um, and also on the bottom left, Elio Colavito is a PhD student who was a co-interviewer co for this uh, particular um, interview. So um, we showed, we created this sensory portrait, we showed it to Robin, and Robin was really supportive in general, but she felt very self-conscious about having her face on the interview because she it was like the middle of the pandemic. She said, um, I love it, but I'd be more comfortable if there was a bit less of my pandemic winter face. Um, so she wanted the video, but she didn't want herself in it. And of course, this was a problem for us because we didn't have any other archival information. You know, there, there's no other archive for this. So there's no B-roll as you would call it, like when in the terms of, you know, film or what have you. So we kind of really had to sort of go back to the beginning. Um, and we worked with uh, Io, um, who was on our team. We'll show you a picture of Io a bit later. Uh, it was a very talented graphic artist and video editor. And he started to create, um, a, and he's the person who, who came up with the visual aesthetic from the Instagram story. So he started to kind of create um, a similar kind of aesthetic for the uh, for the Zoom portraits. And you can, um, I, I'm not going to show you what that um, what that looked like, but you can, I think, by looking at these thematic video shorts, get a sense of what the aesthetic um, ended up looking like, which is basically drawings that are based upon the photographs of the narrators and the film stills uh, from the Zoom footage. Um, so we started to kind of do some thematic video shorts as well. Um, we did one on Care at the Palace where uh, we're looking at narrators' reflections about um, care and mutual aid. And here I was inspired by the work of people like 
uh, Hill Malatino and Dean Spade, both of whom written about, have written about the notions of care and mutual aid in the context of queer and trans uh, life. We also did one, a raid on the palace, um, which basically provides a uh, a kind of overview of the of the events. And this was inspired by the discovery that tenth grade history classes in Ontario were starting to ask the students to write about the Pussy Palace police raid. I mean, you have to love living in Ontario as opposed to living in the US these days for these kinds of topics. Actually, my own son was asked to do this. I was like, are you kidding me? He had no idea what I was working on at the time. But And so, um, so we thought, well, maybe having a short narrative would be really useful uh, for, for that purpose. Um, so I'm just gonna show you uh, just an excerpt of the Care uh, at the Palace um, video short, just to give you a sense of what, what these are like. I was in a private room. What I recall is women running through the place, shouting something like, police are here. Police, 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 put your clothes on. It's about Stop three minutes. Doing. Whoever gave that first call, everybody else would have turned around and shouted, police. Several times, volunteers dropped by the message was consistently there are still men in the building the police are still here there are men in the building i think that three or so people told us that so i also remember feeling kind of taken care of by the the people who were running the event and is it no different than what used to happen in gay bars when being gay was illegal light switches would flash People would shout police, and the men who were dancing with the men and the women who were dancing with the women would quickly switch partners. But you know what? When the police come, everybody participates in warning everybody. Being a volunteer, I was just like, I am on top of whatever you need me to do. Whatever you need right now, I am open. Let's go. A lot of people were really thrown off. It was kind of like, what? So it was a lot of people walking around, just doing the reassuring, just slow down. The organizers have got it. If you want to cover yourself up, that's fine. But there's no need to leave. We're not doing anything wrong. Whenever it opened, as we were waiting in line, they handed us these flyers, letting us know, heads up, these things are illegal. So it was a good thing I, I was standing in line waiting forever because I did read the whole thing. So when we did eventually get raided, I because I read it, I, there were certain things that I was like, oh, I read my pamphlet in line. I don't have to open this door for this cop banging my door. I'm just going to ignore him. It was like the aftermath of tornado energy. Some people were like wide-eyed and quiet, no longer alone. Other people were holding on to their friends and talking closely. Other people were laughing really hard and trying to continue their night, brushing it off in almost uh, in an assertive way. I believe there was a time where there was like consoling and comforting, like women obviously talking to each other. What the hell just happened? Are you okay? How do you feel? Like there was... There was that. I have a memory of that. I went all over everywhere to check in in every corner that I could at that point. People telling me he stepped on someone's foot and ruined their shoe. Someone else got knocked into. Some said they were laughed at. Two people were crying when we talked. Gathered at the temple and had a circle. They gave me a lot of hugs. Well, I think that kind of gives you an idea of the aesthetic of these shorts. Um, the last thing that I'm just going to mention is our, our our capstone project. We're trying to, this is the last major thing that we're doing. Uh, we're in the process of doing this now. We're hoping to wrap up the whole project in September. So this is a, basically an immersive digital exhibition designed by uh, Peter uh, in collaboration with the research team. And it 
describes the evolution of the Pussy Palace events, the, the raid, and the early histories that inform this period of radical sexual culture in Toronto. And the exhibit's focal point is called Explore the Palace. You see it highlighted here. And it invites users to visit nine digitally illustrated rooms inside the palace where clickable objects spark relevant interview sound bites, um, allowing users to engage with first person accounts of the joys and tensions of pat patronizing these events. And then once, uh, avail once we finish it, the exhibit will be live online as a publicly accessible website. Um, and I've got, I asked Matt, who is the, the Z okay, so the Critical Digital Humanities Initiative, our three-year project, one of the things that we've done is we have hired a digital humanities developer to work with faculty research projects and I had this project be a sort of guinea pig so that we I could see how this new type of support would work. Um, and Matt's been fantastic. So he worked with Peter to uh, do work on this exhibition. And I asked him to create like a one minute little video explaining what he's doing for those of you who are interested. So I'm gonna play that right now. And he, he took the one minute literally. So he speaks kind of quickly um, and, and kind of shyly, but uh, I'm sure you'll get it. Hi folks, this is Matt, and I'm the web developer for the Pussy Palace Oral History Projects Digital Exhibit, and I would like to showcase a bit of the site and development for you. So in terms of tech, uh, the application uses the React.js framework for the front end, and for the back end, I'll be serving the React build from a node server with the web server using Nginx as a reverse proxy. Um, onto the exhibit, we have a variety of informational pages, but the bulk of the development work has been on the Explore the Palace section. So um, this is an interactive tour of the space. Right now we are outside the palace, so I'm just going to click into it and show off some rooms. Visitors can navigate through the palace uh, using either a floor map or navigation buttons. So let's check out the dance floor. And visitors can then mouse around the room to click on various glowing objects or silhouettes, and then hear a narrator sound bites. So I'll click on the exit sign. Uh, while the sound bites selected, visitors can turn on and off those captioning. And they can also view a full transcript with a citation. Right, like I love this part of the Hope that you'll come visit the palace when it's all done. Uh, great. And so then we did a, um, just to let, just to share this, we did a virtual walkthrough of the site with some of the project narrators uh, to give them, a, get their feedback and, and to uh, gauge their support for this idea. It was a big success. Narrators were really excited about what we were coming up with, um, and they're looking forward to the launch of this in September, uh, which hopefully will be uh, coming as soon as I finish writing the <laughs> exhibition text. Oh my God, it takes so much longer to write 200 words than it does 2,000. I'm just telling you that for sure, but I'm sure you all know that. So in conclusion, um, basically wanting to just simply emphasize that we're really working on a version of queer digital history that draws from a commitment to public engagement and knowledge mobilization, while at the same time working within a vein of digital history that, as Tara McSpearson has argued in the context of digital humanities, foregrounds visuality and aesthetics. And we're also working in a time where the public digital history is being transformed by social media, in ways that uh, we've only just begun to understand and harness for our own DH projects. And we're also unfortunately working at a time with increased uh, transphobia and anti-queer sentiment, particularly in the US, which normally Canada is somewhat immune from, but unfortunately has started to unfold here. So there's a different political context for this work that um, I'm just sort of worried it's going to have an impact on us eventually, but um, we will see. Anyway, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing any, um, having conversation in the Q&A uh, and wanted to just close by a shout out of thanks to some of the team members who were, have been involved with uh, this project, all of whom are our students, um, except for Alicia. Uh, and IO has now graduated, so uh, but it works for the university. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to uh, having conversation with you, and I, I will stop sharing now. Thank you. <laughs>